I. Theories of Imputation 1. The Pelagian Theory, or Theory of Man's Natural Innocence Pelagius, a British monk, propounded his doctrines at Rome, 409. They were condemned by the Council of Carthage, 418. Pelagianism, however, as opposed to Augustinianism, designates a complete scheme of doctrine with regard to sin, of which Pelagius was the most thorough representative, although every feature of it cannot be ascribed to his authorship. Socinians and Unitarians are the more modern advocates of this general scheme. According to this theory, every human soul is immediately created by God, and created as innocent, as free from depraved tendencies, and as perfectly able to obey God, as Adam was at his creation. The only effect of Adam's sin upon his posterity is the effect of evil example, it has in no way corrupted human nature. The only corruption of human nature is that habit of sinning which each individual contracts by persistent transgression of known law. Adam's sin therefore injured only himself, the sin of Adam is imputed only to Adam. It is imputed in no sense to his descendants. God imputes to each of Adam's descendants only those acts of sin which he has personally and consciously committed. Men can be saved by the law as well as by the gospel, and some have actually obeyed God perfectly, and have thus been saved. Physical death is therefore not the penalty of sin, but an original law of nature, Adam would have died whether he had sinned or not. In Romans 5 verse 12, death passed unto all men, for that all sinned, signifies, all incurred eternal death by. Sinning after Adam's example. Wiggers, Augustinism and Pelagianism, 59, states the seven points of the Pelagian doctrine as follows, 1. Adam was created mortal, so that he would have died even if he had not sinned, 2. Adam's sin injured, not the human race, but only himself, 3. Newborn infants are in the same condition as Adam before the fall, 4. The whole human race neither dies on account of Adam's sin, nor rises on account of Christ's resurrection, 5. Infants, even though not baptized, attain eternal. Life, 6, the law is as good a means of salvation as the gospel, 7, even before Christ some men lived who did not commit sin. In Pelagius' Commander on Romans 5 verse 12, published in Jerome's works, volume 11, we learn who these sinless men were, namely, Abel, Enoch, Joseph, Job, and, among the heathen, Socrates, Aristides, Numa. The virtues of the heathen entitle them to reward. Their worthies were not indeed without evil thoughts and inclinations, but, on the view of Pelagius that all sin consists in act, these evil thoughts and inclinations were not sin. Non pleni nasima, we are born, not full, but vacant, of character. Holiness, Pelagius thought, could not be concreated. Adam's descendants are not weaker, but stronger, than he, since they have fulfilled many commands, while he did not fulfill so much as one. In every man there is a natural conscience, he has an ideal of life, he forms right resolves, he recognizes the claims of law, he accuses himself when he sins, all these things Pelagius regards as indications of a certain holiness in all men, and misinterpretation of these facts. Gives rise to his system, he ought to have seen in them evidences of a divine influence opposing man's bent to evil and leading him to repentance. Grace, on the Pelagian theory, is simply the grace of creation, God's originally endowing man with his high powers of reason and will. While Augustinianism regards human nature as dead, and semi-Pelagianism regards it as sick, Pelagianism proper declares it to be well. Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 243, SYST, Doct, 2-338, Neither the body, man's surroundings, nor the inward operation of God, have any determining influence upon the will. God reaches man only through external means, such as Christ's doctrine, example, and promise. This clears God of the charge of evil, but also takes from him the authorship of good. It is deism, applied to man's nature. God cannot enter man's being if he would, and he would not if he could. Free will is everything. Ib, 1 626, SYST, Doct, 2 188, 189. Pelagianism at one time counts it too great an honor that man should be directly moved upon by God, and at another, too great addition that man should not be able to do without God. In this inconsistent reasoning, it shows its desire to be rid of God as much as possible. The true conception of God requires a living relation to man, as well as to the external universe. The true conception of man requires satisfaction of his longings and powers by Reception of impulses and strength from God. 
Pelagianism, in seeking. For man a development only like that of nature, shows that its high estimate of man is only a delusive one. It really degrades him, by ignoring his true dignity and destiny. See Ib, 1 124, 125, SYST, Doct, 1 136, 137, 2 43 45, SYST, Doct, 2 338, 339, 2 148, SYST, Doct, 344. Also Schaff, Church History, 2 783-856, Doctrines of the Early Socinians, in Princeton Essays, 1 194-211, Werther, Pelagianismus. For substantially Pelagian statements, see Sheldon, Sin and Redemption, Ellis, Half Century of Unitarian Controversy, 76. Of the Pelagian theory of sin, we may say, a. It has never been recognized as scriptural, nor has it been formulated in confessions, by any branch of the Christian Church. Held only sporadically and by individuals, it has ever been regarded by the Church at large as heresy. This constitutes at least a presumption against its truth. As slavery was the sum of all villainy, so the Pelagian doctrine may be called the sum of all false doctrine. Pelagianism is a survival of paganism, in its majestic egoism and self complacency. Cicero, in his Natura Deorum, says that men thank the gods for external advantages, but no man ever thanks the gods for his virtues, that he is honest or pure or merciful. Pelagius was first roused to opposition by hearing a bishop in the public services of the church quote Augustine's prayer, D.A. quod jubes, et jube quod vis, give what thou commandest, and command what thou wilt. From this he was led to formulate the gospel according to Saint Cicero, so perfectly does the Pelagian doctrine reproduce the pagan teaching. The impulse of the Christian, on the other hand, is to refer all gifts and graces to a divine source in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God afore prepared that. We should walk in them, John 15 verse 16, Ye did not choose me, but I chose you, 1 13, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. H. Ober, and every virtue we possess, and every victory won, and every thought of holiness, are his alone. Augustine had said that, man is most free when controlled by God alone, Deo, solo dominanti, liberimus, de more eccl, zi. Gore, in Lux Mundi, 320, in Christ humanity is perfect, because in him it retains no part of that false independence which, in all its manifold forms, is the secret of sin. Pelagianism, on the contrary, is man's declaration of independence. Harnack, his dogma, 5 200, the essence of Pelagianism, the key to its whole mode of thought, lies in this proposition of Julian, homo libero arbitrio emancipatus a deo of man, created free, is in his whole being independent of God. He has no longer to do with God, but with himself alone. God re-enters man's life only at the end, at the judgment, a doctrine of the orphanage of humanity b. It contradicts scripture in denying, a. That evil disposition and state, as well as evil acts, are sin, b. That such evil disposition and state are inborn in all mankind, c. That men universally are guilty of overt transgression so soon as they come to moral consciousness, d. That no man is able without divine help to fulfill the law, e. That all men, without exception, are dependent for salvation upon God's atoning, regenerating, sanctifying grace, f. That man's present. State of corruption, condemnation, and death, is the direct effect of Adam's transgression. The Westminster Confession, Chapter 6. Section 4, declares that, we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil. To Pelagius, on the contrary, sin is a mere incident. He knows only of sins, not of sin. He holds the atomic, or atomistic, theory of sin, which regards it as consisting in isolated volitions. Pelagianism, holding, as it does, that virtue and vice consist only in single decisions, does not account for character at all. There is no such thing as a state of sin, or a self-propagating power of sin. And yet upon these the scriptures lay greater emphasis than upon mere acts of transgression. John 3 verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which comes of a sinful and guilty stock is itself, from the very beginning, sinful and guilty, Dorna. 
witness the tendency to degradation in families and nations. Amiel says that the great defect of liberal Christianity is its superficial conception of sin. The tendency dates far back, Tertullian spoke of the soul as naturally Christian, anima naturalita Christiana. The tendency has come down to modern times, Crane, The Religion of Tomorrow, 246. It is only when children grow up and begin to absorb their environment that they lose their artless loveliness. A Rochester Unitarian preacher publicly declared it to be as much a duty to believe in the natural purity of man, as to believe in the natural purity of God. Dr. Lyman Abbott speaks of, the shadow which the Manichaean theology of Augustine, borrowed by Calvin, cast upon all. Children, in declaring them born to an inheritance of wrath as a viper's brood. Dr. Abbott forgets that Augustine was the greatest opponent of Manichaeanism and that his doctrine of inherited guilt may be supplemented by a doctrine of inherited divine influences tending to salvation. Professor G. A. Co. tells us that all children are within the household of God, that they are already members of his kingdom, that the adolescent change is a step not into the Christian life, but within the Christian life. We are taught that salvation is by education. But education is only a way of presenting truth. It still remains needful that the soul should accept the truth. Pelagianism ignores or denies the presence in every child of a congenital selfishness which hinders acceptance of the truth, and which, without the working of the divine spirit, will absolutely counteract the influence of the truth. Augustine was taught his guilt and helplessness by transgression, while Pelagius remained ignorant of the evil of his own heart. Pelagius might have said with Wordsworth, Prelude, 534, I had approached, like other youths the shield of human nature from the golden side, and would have fought, even unto the death, to attest the quality of the metal which I saw. Schaff, on the Pelagian controversy, in Bib Sac, 5.205-243, the controversy, resolves itself into the question whether redemption and sanctification are the work of man or of God. Pelagianism in its whole mode of thinking starts from man and seeks to work itself upward gradually by means of an imaginary goodwill, to holiness and communion with God. Augustinianism pursues the opposite way, deriving from God's unconditioned and all-working grace a new life and all power of working good. The first is led from freedom into a legal, self-righteous piety, the other rises from the slavery of sin to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For the first, revelation is of force only as an outward help, or the power of a high example, for the last, it is the inmost life the very marrow and blood of the new man. The first involves an ebionitic view of Christ, as noble man, not high priest or king, the second finds in him one in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The first makes conversion a process of gradual moral purification on the ground of original nature, with the last, it is a total change, in which the old passes away and all becomes new. Rationalism is simply the form in which Pelagianism becomes theoretically complete. The high opinion which the Pelagian holds of the natural will is transferred with equal right by the rationalist to the natural reason. The one does without grace, as the other does without revelation. Pelagian divinity is rationalistic. Rationalistic morality is Pelagian. See this compendium, page 89. Allen, Religious Progress, 98 to 100. Most of the mischief of religious controversy springs from the desire and determination to impute to one's opponent positions, which he does not hold, or to draw inferences from his principles, insisting that he shall be held responsible for them, even though he declares that he does not teach them. We say that he ought to accept them, that he is bound logically to do so, that they are necessary deductions from his system, that the tendency of his teaching is in these directions, and then we denounce and condemn him for what he disowns. It was in this way that Augustine filled out for Pelagius the gaps in his scheme, which he thought it necessary to do, in order to make Pelagius's teaching consistent and complete, and Pelagius, in his turn, drew inferences from the Augustinian theology, about which Augustine would have preferred to maintain a discreet silence. Neither Augustine nor Calvin was anxious to make prominent the doctrine of the reprobation of the wicked to damnation, but preferred to dwell on the more attractive, more rational tenet of the elect to salvation, as subjects of the divine choice and approbation, substituting for the obnoxious word reprobation the milder, euphemistic word preterition. It was their opponents who were bent on forcing them out of their reserve, pushing them into what seemed the consistent sequence of their attitude 
and then holding it up before the world for execration. And the same remark would apply to almost every theological contention that has embittered the church's experience. See, it rests upon false philosophical principles, as, for example, a, that the human will is simply the faculty of volitions, whereas it is also, and chiefly, the faculty of self-determination to an ultimate end, b, that the power of a contrary choice is essential to the existence of will, whereas the will fundamentally determined to self-gratification has this power only with respect to subordinate choices, and cannot by a single volition reverse its moral state, c, that ability. Is the measure of obligation, a principle which would diminish the sinner's responsibility, just in proportion to his progress in sin, d, that law consists only in positive enactment, whereas it is the demand of perfect harmony with God, inwrought into man's moral nature, e, that each human soul is immediately created by God, and holds no other relations to moral law than those which are individual, whereas all human souls are organically connected with each other, and together have a corporate relation to God's law, by virtue of their derivation. From one common stock. A. Ninda, Church History, 2.564-625, holds one of the fundamental principles of Pelagianism to be, the ability to choose, equally and at any moment, between good and evil. There is no recognition of the law by which acts produce states, the power which repeated acts of evil possess to give a definite character and tendency to the will itself. Volition is an everlasting, tick, tick, and swinging of the pendulum, but no moving forward of the hands of the clock follows. There is no continuity of moral life, no character, in man, angel, devil, or God. B. C. Art. On Power of Contrary Choice, in Princeton Essays, 1.212-233. Pelagianism holds that no confirmation in holiness is possible. Thornwell, Theology, the sinner is as free as the saint, the devil as the angel. Harris, Philos, Basis of Theism, 399, the theory that indifference is essential to freedom implies that will never acquires. Character, that voluntary action is atomistic, every act disintegrated. From every other, that character, if acquired, would be incompatible with freedom. By mere volition the soul now a plenum can become a vacuum, or now a vacuum can become a plenum. On the Pelagian view of freedom, see Julius Muller, Doctrine of Sin, 37-44. See, Psalm 79 verse 8, Remember not against us the iniquities of our forefathers, 106-6, We have sinned with our fathers. Notice the analogy of individuals who suffer from the effects of parental mistakes or of national transgression. Julius Muller, Doct. Sin, 2.316, 317. Neither the atomistic nor the organic view of human nature is the complete truth. Each must be complemented by the other. For statement of race responsibility, see Dorna, Glaubenslayer, 2.30-39, 51-64, 161-162, 161, System of Doctrine, 2.324-334. 345-359, 3,50-54, among the scripture proofs of the moral connection of the individual with the race are the visiting of the sins of the fathers upon the children, the obligation of the people to punish the sin of the individual, that the whole land may not incur guilt, the offering of sacrifice for a murder, the perpetrator of which is unknown. Achan's crime is charged to the whole people. The Jewish race is the better for. Its parentage, and other nations are the worse for theirs. The Hebrew People become a legal personality. Is it said that none are punished for the sins of their fathers unless they are like their fathers? But to be unlike their fathers requires a new heart. They who are not held accountable for the sins of their fathers are those who have recognized their responsibility for them, and have repented for their likeness to their ancestors. Only the self-isolating spirit says, Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis 4 verse 9, and thinks to construct a constant equation between individual misfortune and individual sin. The calamities of the righteous led to an ethical conception of the relation of the individual to the community. Such sufferings show that men can love God disinterestedly, that the good has unselfish friends. These sufferings are substitutionary, when born as belonging to the sufferer, not foreign to him, the guilt of others attaching to him by virtue of his national or race relation to them. So. Moses in Exodus 34 verse 9, David in Psalms 51 verse 6, Isaiah in his 59 9-16, recognize the 
Connection between personal sin and race sin. Christ restores the bond between man and his fellows, turns the hearts of the fathers to the children. He is the creator of a new race consciousness. In him as the head we see ourselves bound to, and responsible for others. Love finds it morally impossible to isolate itself. It restores the consciousness of unity and the recognition of common guilt. Does every man stand for himself in the end, t? This would be so, only if each man became a sinner solely by free and conscious personal decision, either in the present, or in a past state of existence. But this is not scriptural. Something comes before personal transgression, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, John 3 verse 6. Personality is the stronger for recognizing the race sin. We have common joy in the victories of the good, so in shameful lapses we have sorrow. These are not our worst moments, but our best, there is something great in them. Original sin must be displeasing to God, for it perverts the reason, destroys likeness to God, excludes from communion with God, makes redemption necessary, leads to actual sin, influences future generations. But to complain of God for permitting its propagation is to complain of his not destroying the race, that is, to complain of one's own existence. See Shed, Hist Doctrine, 2 colon 93-110, Hagenbach, Hist. Doctrine, 1 colon 287, 296 to 310, Martinson, Dogmatics, 354 to 362, Princeton Essays, 1 colon 74-97, Dabney, Theology, 296 to 302, 314, 315.